Thank you for joining us for DC Community Heritage Project, our neighborhoods, our stories, our voices. I'm Patsy Fletcher of the DC Historic Preservation Office. I will be your host on this journey as the DC Community Heritage Project features three stories from recent grantees. We will bring to you projects that invoke triumph, discovery, and perseverance. These projects originated right here in the District of Columbia and were supported and funded in part by the Humanities Council and the DC Historic Preservation Office through its grant from the National Park Service. Our first featured story comes from a group of neighbors that are deeply rooted in the culture and preservation of the beauty of the Northeast sector of Washington, DC, better known as Eastland Gardens. <music> Eastern Garden is, is a predominant African-American community. We are located in northeast, far northeast Washington, borderline with Washington, uh, Maryland, and it's um, next to uh, 295, adjacent to the Aquatic Gardens and also um, part of National Park Service. The Eastland Gardens Flower Club was initiated by Rudine Davis in 1956. Ms. Rudine Davis thought that it was important to get the community together to create some kind of beautification in the neighborhood due to the fact that it was a new um, development. There was not much place for the African American community to go, so they thought that having some kind of club where they could get together and talk about other things than family you know, that was a good thing. When it comes to the architects, um, in our research we found out that there are approximately 18 African American architects have designed, I would say, 80% of the homes in Eastland Gardens. And over uh, this well, research we did was from, 19, from 1928 to 1955. We have not done the research after 55, but we're planning for our next project that we're um, looking down the road to do. But there's 18 African Americans that have designed these homes and about approximately eight um, African American builders that build most of these homes also. From a construction perspective, these homes are still, you know, in very good shape. Um, when you look at some of the homes that have these fabulous outdoor porches, um, one that has, um, that has brickwork arches, which are, you know, something that you see very rarely today. So th those types of details and sometimes not, not very, not gaudy, but, but ornamentation and attention to detail are some things that you can find in looking through the community. and the ability of the builders to interpret those things and actually build them to where they're standing today and really have no problems at all is uh, very exciting. You know, for, for my grandfather, um, his house was, uh, was built by a gentleman named Mr. Porter. And um, you know, they had a, their goal and dream was to own their own home. And so you know, when you think about having that dream and sort of in our in you know American society, you know to be, you know a homeowner, um, and especially to own your home that was designed by you know an African American, you know something that's even twice as special. And so I think the fact that the neighborhood has that sort of history is uh, is really something special, and and you know something that you really want to be a part of. I think certainly it speaks to the ingenuity and evolution of the minority architect as the years went along and you see some homes that you know clearly were um, built at a certain time based on certain trends so you know you, you again you see a, a diversity in thought process and imagination. So we identify these homes and we know who are the architects. We have like Romulus Archer, we have Howard Mackey, we have um, Louis Giles Sr., we have um, Louis Downing, 
who these some of these architects were professors at Howard University. So they used the neighborhood as a training ground. They created this beautiful neighborhood. We are proud to consider that here Eastern Gardens has the highest concentration of African American architects of Washington DC. Even though, you know, this was, you know, almost a hundred years ago, this community was sort of one of the, I would say, predecessors of custom home, custom home building, because, you know, there's just such a rich variety and diversity in all of the types of homes that are here now. Whenever you come to Eastland Gardens, there is an entrance way, and we call it the gateway of the gardens. We clean that up and do planting of flowers and all of that. But also, if you look at when you come in, and there is a sign which says Eastland Gardens and the brickwork that was done by one of the members who lives in Eastland Garden. And it was, this is one of the outstanding, actually, that's what we use for the Civic Association logo as what we are, Eastland Gardens. And Mr. Logan, who was the person who actually built that because he was a mason brick mason, so he built that for us. So that's one of the partnership we have, the community, with National Park Services and what it represents as the entrance of who we are. You know, Eastern Gardens is a hid hidden treasure in the city, you know, you have like a, a suburban neighborhood within uh, the city limits, you know. The community is, uh, it is a village. I personally think that uh, Eastern Gardens is one of the best kept secrets in, in Washington. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Welcome back to the DC Community Heritage Project. Our neighborhood, our stories, our voices. Our next featured project shows us how young historians research, dig, and strive to give their ancestors a voice. The project, you know, has, was started last year. Last year is when we actually, the first, the first sequence of the project, in which we had middle schoolers, you know, research and look about the history and basically expound more knowledge about the cemetery. And that's when we gain more information on the retrospective of the history and the individuals buried there. Doing the research, it was very interesting to find everything that we did. I had no idea about Georgetown having African Americans before now. None of it I knew beforehand. It was also challenging. It wasn't easy. You couldn't just pull it up on Google because it was buried history, literally buried. So it was hard to find, but you know, with our mentors, we were able to do it. My inspiration is that I've always known that there was an African American burial ground mm -hmm. there. Never been there though till last year because I was like, well, there's this African American burial ground. I went over there expecting to see you know, a cemetery. I got a cemetery, but it was in a state of, I guess, what you would call dila ruined dilapidation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, a lot of people were mistreating the cemetery, walking the dogs over it. Mm -hmm. um, when I had actually first gotten there, it had finished raining, so it seemed like it was really in a bad state. I'm, and a lot of tombstones have been sunken in and in bad condition. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, that's what really got me keenly involved after witnessing that. When you want to go to visit the actual cemetery, it's in this back alley in order to get to the actual cemetery itself. And it's just, you go there and you're just like, just so distraught that the place has been left like this, especially since, you know, it's our ancestors and a connection to the history and the impact we have in Georgetown. The process of research mm -hmm. has been going through Washington Collection to find out as much as I could about it, which then led me to go to 
DC archives, mm -hmm. and they have been very helpful. Mr. Clarence Davis and the individuals there. Not many people know about DC archives, but it's a very central, important mm -hmm. piece for getting information. Mm -hmm. And then um, the Library of Congress provided us with a lot of information. My name is Fonta Kamara. I'm 17 years old, and my group's task was to go through newspaper records and the census at the Library of Congress and the Martin Luther King Library to find anything that mentioned the Mount Zion Church community and any prominent African American members in Georgetown between the years of 1800 and 1929. Hi, I'm Azania Ture, I'm 18, and my group's um, project was to go through the newspaper articles and to find interesting news about the cemetery. My name is Haja Kamara, I'm 15 years old, and my group's task was to see, to look through the DC estate records and figure out the names and the housing records of people who are buried in the Mount Zion Cemetery. Um, hi, my name is Angelique and I'm 15 and my group's task was to create a map based on the information that we found um, in MLK Library and our primary resource was the housing of the state's District of Columbia and that was through 1801 through 1850. That this cemetery was actually used as a passageway in the Underground Railroad mm -hmm. during slavery. Um, the church vault had a vault in the cemetery in which when you, people were passing the Underground Railroad, enslaved individuals would actually have to hide in that vault, and that's where dead bodies were sometimes placed. So to me, it's really truly like a land of life and death. You know, I went to the park area that went out through the top, mm -hmm. because there's an entrance to the park and there's an entrance to the back of the alley. And when I came up there, it's like, you know, I was rising up into this land of the dead, this necropolis, mm -hmm. and to see, you know, the state that I was in, like even in death, these individuals are getting the respect. Mm -hmm. So it's powerful, but I believe that now that we're pulling up the history, we're bringing more prominence mm -hmm. to Mount Zion, and not just prominence to Mount Zion, but the community that used to be there. And this heritage, I believe, has been largely ignored, and it's, it can't be ignored for long because it's a very vital heritage. I believe that it will you know, have a large impact. It should, mm -hmm. in my opinion, because you know, what's being done right here, this is history. Mm -hmm. The fact that these teenagers here, they're acting as historians. They're pulling up not unknown information. Mm -hmm. And you yourself. Yes, me, myself actually, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had to coordinate it. I've had to pull up information myself for them to find. Mm -hmm. And me, it's been a very powerful experience becoming a historian mm -hmm. and, you know, and a research investigator, the lead research investigator. We should, we should go and help clean up the cemetery. We, in the beginning, it was kind of hard work. You didn't really understand why we had to do this work in the beginning, but as we learned more, it was more our duty for ourselves rather than just the program itself. And once you learn the history, then you'll want to do it too, because it is our history and it is our ancestors. It's not anybody's, it's ours, so it's our responsibility. Well, I think the community can actually try to go to Mount Zion Cemetery and learn more about the culture and the history that African Americans have and their impact on the city. Because since African Americans were the majority of the population in Georgetown, they literally built the city from the ground up. And there's so much history that not many people know about it. So just being able to go to the cemetery, talking to historians, going to the African American Civil War Museum, I think that can help people become more aware of our presence in the city. Jack Frost, you do have beautiful teeth. My my what? Are they really as white as they say? Yes! Oh, they really do sparkle like freshly fallen snow. This is an excellent example of what teeth should look like. Check out the iridescence of that incisor. The beauty of that bicuspid. The magnificence of those molars. And the best way to achieve such terrific teeth is brushing. Two minutes, twice a day. Not 30 seconds. Not a minute, 45. Two minutes. That's all it takes. They're beautiful. Thank you for staying tuned in. I'm Patsy Fletcher and I've been your host as the DC Community Heritage Project features worthy grant recipients and the projects that they hold dear to their hearts. 
each one breathing life into their communities. Our next project comes from one of the oldest photography clubs in Washington, D.C., and the oldest still operating African American photography club. Sit back and relax as we take a snapshot of the past and a glance into the future of the Photocraft Club. The club was established in 1937 uh, at the 12th Street Y. It seemed that the Anthony Bowen uh, YMCA, which is really known as the Colored Y back then, that was in 1912, had as its founder Anthony Bowen. So that Y was established in 1912 and Photograph Camera Club came into the club in about 1937. Uh, they were offering darkroom techniques, they were giving competitions, they had speakers, and it was a nice place for photographers to gather. I heard about Photograph Camera Club through my professor at UDC. His name is Tex Gavings. That's Joseph Tex Gavings. He's retired, by the way. And Professor Gavings said, Irene, you need to go check out and join Photograph Camera Club. So I did. And that was uh, in 1978 when I joined the club. One of the uh, interesting things about the Photograph Club's uh, relationship with the Moreland Spingarn Research Center at Howard University is that in many ways it was initiated uh, when the Research Center became the national repository for the National Newspaper Publishers Association. It was very clear that many of their participants were members of the black press and many of them were located in Washington, D.C. As the center began its major campaign in documenting black history and culture, we realized that that group of photographers would be an important ingredient in our documentation and we began to work with many local photographers and trying to determine the nature of their work and what they had that helped to document our past history. As we began to do so, we came into contact with the Photograph Club, to which many of them belong, and we thought that we might be able to afford an opportunity for many of these photographers to be able to archive their work so that it would be a, a, an important part of the documentation of black history and culture. I learned um, a lot about that club and it seemed to me that the club was a who's who in African-American photographers. Uh, for example, a club member by the name of Robert McNeil, Negro uh, Fun, he has had uh, the Washington Post to take um, several of his, of his images and put them on display. Ed Fletcher was another photographer who brought new things to the club. For example, uh, color photography. No one had done or seen color photography until Ed Fletcher brought that to the club. Francis Butler, uh, he was a president for the club and director. And Francis was a design engineer. And Frank um, has a wealth of knowledge. He even has a patent uh, from the Patent Office. Uh, he has a couple of his images at the Kennedy Library. Uh, he's had his work on exhibition in Beijing, China. Uh, just, I guess it's just the, the mult, a myriad of talent in that club that, that came, that was there for people to just have access to. So um, just a fantastic place with a fantastic group of men and women. John Pinkhart is the founding father of Photograph Camera Club. That started in the late 20s when a, a friend of the family who went to Howard University was bunking with us and he gave me a box camera and he also knew how to develop film. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eastman used to sell these little packets, glass tubes of film of uh, chemicals. 
with which you could develop your film. And there was a big problem then with film curling up, so Eastman had a big deal with what they call non-curling film. So with me it was a box camera off and on until the 1930s, at which time I got an Argus 2AF, I believe it was, $12.50. He is one, one outstanding man. And at 100 years old, I wanted to capture uh, a little bit of history about John because I knew in talking to him, um, he was a, just he's just a tremendous person. He has he has a a wide range of interests. The man uh, loves chess. Um, he was uh, a champion chess player and even went to other areas within the United States to compete when he was at the uh, 12th Street Y. I think the club was called the Paramount Chess Club. Uh, John loves classical music. The man also plays the violin. Uh, he loves to travel. He's gone all over the United States driving, and he also loves to travel outside of the United States. Uh, he works hard in his church at Shiloh Baptist Church. I just think He's somebody that you should know about and others in the community should know about John Pinkert and how he has impacted, I think, uh, my life as well as members of the camera club because he's taught a number of workshop seminars. Um, he's just a wonderful man. The club had a significant impact on young budding photographers. Here was a venue that they could go to, uh, they could learn, they could have the older, more uh, seasoned photographers, the professionals, to teach them. They, they, they would show them how to do things. Uh, they had dark room uh, access, so they learned how to make use of the dark room. Using that dark room, they were able to um, take that and maybe use it for their own businesses or apply for a job that might have required darkroom techniques. Uh, so it was fantastic for the young photographer to have access to photograph and all the, the knowledge that the um, older photographers could bring them as well as to show their work. I mean, just a place to exhibit their work. If you're interested in finding out more about Photograph Camera Club, I want you to get a pencil. Are you ready? If you'd like more information about the Shaw Community Heritage, John H. Pinkard, uh, and the Photograph Camera Club project, you want to see what we've done go to the DC Digital Museum. Seven thousand high school students drop out every school day. That's a line of desks more than four miles long. We can keep students in school. Visit boostup.org and take the first step. I hope you've enjoyed our community stories. The DC Community Heritage Project began in 2005 to explore the social and cultural history of DC neighborhoods from the perspective of long-time residents. Jointly sponsored by the DC Historic Preservation Office and the Humanities Council of Washington, DC, the DC Community Heritage Project puts the power of community history where it belongs, in the hands of residents. By providing information, training, grants up to $2,000, and a venue through which to showcase the rewards of their studies. 
The results have been increased local interest in the social and cultural history of DC neighborhoods, a developing body of documented histories available to the public, and best of all, a sense of investment in the preservation and future development of DC's rich community heritage. Information about the DCCHP may be found through the Humanities Council website, wdchumanities.org, or the DC Historic Preservation Office website at planning.dc.gov. Click on Historic Preservation, then on the DC History icon. Interested persons may also contact Mark Smith at 202-387-8391 or email him at msmith at wdchumanities.org. You may also contact me, Patsy Fletcher, at 202-741-0816 or by email patsy.fletcher at dc.gov. Thank you for joining us for the DC Community Heritage Project. Our neighborhoods, our stories, our voices.